Welcome, everyone. I am Kira Epstein, the co director at the New School at Commonweal. And it's wonderful to have you all. So today's conversation is co-presented with the Collaborative for Health and Environment, or CHE. It's a pleasure to work with the CHE team to co-present some of their CHE Cafe conversations, including today's conversation with Beth Sawin and Bev Thorpe about multi-solving for climate chemicals and health. I'll turn this over to CHE Director Kristen Schaefer to introduce herself and her guests in a minute. But for those of you who haven't been with us before, the New School at Commonweal is a learning community of dialogue and conversation that explores how to build more resilience and better stewardship for body, soul, community, and the earth. We produce our conversations and we make them available for thousands of listeners worldwide on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. We've been doing this since 2007 and we have more than 300 podcasts available on our media sites. I'll turn it now over to Kristen, the Director of Commonweal's Collaborative for Health and Environment. Kristen. Thank you so much, Kira, and welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for this important conversation. It's really fun to see where people are zooming in from, from all over the U.S. and and around the world. So I'm very excited for today's conversation. My name is Kristen Schaefer, and as Kira noted, I'm the Director of the Collaborative for Health and Environment, or CHE. And I'd like to say just a few words about CHE before I introduce our topic and speakers. Uh, For the past 22 years now, CHE has been supporting and amplifying environmental health science, also organizing strategic conversations around key emerging issues in this field, and working to translate research in ways that support environmental health and justice. I invite you to visit our website at healthandenvironment.org to find out more about our work. Quite a bit of our work here at CHE focuses on the crisis of chemical contamination, the health impacts of these exposures, and what can be done to protect workers, families, and communities from toxic chemicals. We've also done some work to highlight the public health impacts of our changing climate. And we're very aware that these two accelerating crises are interlinked in many ways. I came across the concept of multi-solving as I was stepping in as CHE director about a year and a half ago. And I was immediately taken by the simple elegance of this really very common sense approach. It seemed clear to me that at this intertwined intersection of climate and chemicals, it makes sense to to find out how we can invest in solutions that address both crises at the same time. And we also need to avoid setting up trade-offs that could well happen. For example, if we invest in climate solutions that increase exposure to harmful chemicals, especially in frontline communities where toxic burdens are already much too high. So I'm thrilled to be in conversation today with Dr. Elizabeth Sawin and Beverly Thorpe, the two brilliant leaders in their respective fields. We'll start today with brief presentations from each of them and then have a panel discussion and finally open up for your questions. So I invite you to drop in your questions, as Kira said, in the Q&A box at any time um, during our discussion. And also, as I think Kira noted, this discussion is scheduled to last for an hour and 15 minutes. So I'll now introduce both of our speakers and then we'll dive in. Beth Sawin is the founder and director of the Multi-Solving Institute, uh, what what they call a think-do tank that helps people implement solutions that protect the climate while improving equity, health, biodiversity, economic vitality, and well-being. She is a biologist with a PhD from MIT who has been analyzing complex systems related to climate change for 25 years. Beth lives in rural Vermont, where she and her husband grow as much of their own food as they can manage. For those who are online, we'll drop her full bio in the chat. It's an impressive one. I can say that every time I've heard Beth speak, I've been both intrigued and inspired by the power of the multi-solving approach. Beverly Thorpe is co-founder of Clean Production Action and has researched and promoted clean production strategies to advance a non-toxic economy internationally since 1986. Bev received her degree in geography from Leicester University in the UK 
and is an annual lecturer on chemicals policy and corporate practices at Lund University in Sweden. She lives in Toronto, Canada, and there's much more about Bev's visionary leadership throughout her career in her full bio. We'll drop that into the chat now as well. And I've known and respected Bev for many years and have in recent years heard her speak per really persuasively about exactly how the chemical and climate crises are linked and need to be addressed together. Thanks so very much to both of you for being here with us today. And with that, I'll hand it over to Beth to get us started with an introduction to the multi-solving approach. Beth, welcome. Thank you, Kristen. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for your attention. Um, I think these days, attention is one of the most important gifts we give to one another. So I really appreciate the hour and 15 minutes we have together. Uh, my assignment at the beginning here is to introduce the idea of multi-solving, share some examples, um, maybe a little bit about uh, why I think it's important, a little bit about what makes it hard, um, a little bit about how to know it when you see it. Um, and I think just trying to give a few concepts that can anchor the rest of the conversation that we're going to have. Um, so the definition of multi-solving that I tend to use is actions or investments that um, address multiple goals or achieve multiple goals at the same time. Um, uh, that's the, the sort of basic definition of multi-solving. And then there's two important things that I also really look for. Uh, one is attention to equity. And I think we'll talk about that throughout this time, um, that multi-solving um, at its best and its most effective it cultivates this really um, prioritization of equity and social justice. Um, and the second attribute that I'm talking about more and more um, is acting out of a worldview of interconnection or out of a worldview of recognizing um, our web of interrelationships between people, between nations, um, between people and other beings on earth. Um, Multi-solving works because of that interconnection. And multi-solvers, one thing that um, makes me so fond of them is the way in which they embody that, that um, ethic of interconnection. Um, so that's, that's the definition, actions or investments that uh, achieve multiple goals for, for one action. Um, often the best way to sort of uh, get the get the concept of multi-solving is to share examples. So I'll start with just two um, of my favorites. And you can find a lot um, more. We have a nice library of case studies of multi-solving on our, um, our website for the Multi-Solving Institute. Um, so one of my favorite examples from an early uh, scan that we did was we were looking for examples um, of multi-solving at the intersection of climate change and health. And one of my colleagues researched an example from New Zealand called Warm Up New Zealand. And it was a response to the uh, financial crisis of 2008, 2009. In New Zealand, like in many places, there was um, a slump in the construction industry. And this was a project uh, sponsored uh, by the New Zealand government to try to get that industry back to work by weatherizing homes, by making residential homes more energy efficient. So it accomplished that. Um, but in an interesting twist, they had some health researchers looking at the people who lived in these homes that had been uh, had, had these energy tune-ups. And what they found was particularly for people with respiratory illnesses, um, they were seeing much better health outcomes that translated into savings for the health system. Um, so they were seeing less visits to the emergency department, a reduced need for prescription medication, just by virtue of living in um, tighter, warmer homes. And in fact, when they ran the numbers, um, those health benefits were were um, really paying for themselves over and again relative to the cost of the program. It's so much so that um, the health ministry became a partner in the project, um, and eventually doctors could refer patients for these home energy improvements. Um, so sometimes we joke, you know, instead of take an aspirin and call me in the morning, um, this was a project that was like get new windows and a new boiler um, and call me in the morning. 
And there's other examples around the world. There's some pilots in the UK doing the same type of approach. So we would say that was multi-solving for several goals. Um, it was for the economic vitality of uh, the construction industry, which that was successful. Um, it was reducing energy use. And with reduced energy use comes um, less greenhouse gas emissions, given that most energy um, still comes from fossil fuels. Um, it was also reducing what's sometimes called the energy burden, the percent of someone's paycheck they spend on utilities, um, leaving people with more of their um, financial resources for better food, for medicine, for education, for recreation. Um, and it was improving health outcomes for people living in those buildings. So we'd say that was an example of multi-solving. Its attention to equity um, was really demonstrated in the sort of selection of um, uh, residents for the program with both criteria for um, economic well-being and uh, for senior citizens were sort of two marginalized groups that benefited especially from the project. Um, Another example I'll tell a little bit quicker, um, but this is another one I think is really inspiring here in the U.S. Um, in South Carolina was a project called Living Shorelines, which involved the Nature Conservancy and local organizations and fishing organizations. And it was built on um, what's sometimes called ecosystem restoration. So it was um, uh, using an oyster bed approach to um, improve biodiversity, which translated into better um, better resources for fisher um, men that depended on that resource for their economic well-being, more so more biodiversity, and also um, a climate change resilience benefit in that this would would help with um, sea level rise and storm surge and flooding that was impacting that community. So there you again have people coming together across multiple sectors, um, achieving multiple goals at the same time. So in today's conversation, what we really want to explore is what might what's happening and what else might be possible at this intersection of climate change, chemicals, and health. Um, and and from these examples, you can get maybe the sense that multi-solving isn't um, you know specific to any set of goals it's um it's an approach that can be applied to to many and in fact we find it um everywhere we look in all sectors um and and at all scales really too from neighborhood to nat national or even um between you know projects at an international scale um that said multi-selling remains the exception and not the rule um, and I think we'll talk a lot in this this time together about what are the things that maybe make multi-solving more rare uh, than it needs to be. Um, I think I probably only have a minute or two left, Kristen, one minute maybe. Um, so yeah, I think in that minute, I then will just stress um, that because multi-solving is not particular to any sector or any particular set of goals. Um, the thing that all multi-solving has in common is really, we sometimes say that it's a way and not a what. Um, and the way has particular features like insisting upon working across traditional silos, whether those are disciplines or jurisdictions. Um, it has a commitment to building trusting relationships across silos. Uh, it has that prioritization of equity that I mentioned. Um, and it has a commitment to solidarity between issues. Um, I'd contrast that to the sort of transactional alliances, you know, I'll vote for your thing if you'll vote for mine. Um, in multi-solving, it goes a bit deeper than that to really um, feeling the importance of someone else's issue as much as the importance of the issue that brought you to the table. So in this nexus, what we're really asking is what might happen if all the climate activists cared as much about the issues of toxics and vice versa, if everyone working for cleaner chemicals um, had a climate lens as well. Great. Thank you so much, Beth. And as I said, I'm just I'm so inspired by sort of the simple elegance of this. And at the same time, it's it's complex. It's embracing that complexity. Um, and, and it's not so much a tool as a mindset. And, and I think goes against what often we we focus on that one problem and just don't think about 
um, the related problems that and and the co-benefits that might be happening um, if we if we solve that problem in a certain way. Um, I really look forward to to diving in further in in our discussion to explore that. So, but Bev, I am going to now hand over to you to share your perspective on this intersecting um, crises of chemical contamination and climate change. Um, and Bev is going to have some slides to cha- share. And for those who want to follow along uh, with the slides, you can find those at the CHE website, healthandenvironment.org. So Bev, welcome. Thank you so much, Christian. And Beth, I, I love that introduction to multi-solving. Um, what I'm going to do over the, just as an intro on this issue um, with five slides is just sort of ground us in where we are with this climate chemicals interface. Um, I've worked on chemicals and toxics issues for longer than I want to say, but it's been a good 30 years or so. Um, and, uh, and I really take heart with Beth, your your whole sort of summation that what would happen if the climate and chemicals movements were to more um, cohesively entwine. So the big picture here is that um, I think the climate chemicals interface has become better understood. And we're now hearing the term triple planetary crisis to describe this intersection of pollution, climate crisis and biodiversity loss. Um, And as we see here, we we are at code red for climate change mitigation. And we're also at code red for halting the ongoing toxic assault from the chemical sector. Um, Many of you working in toxics will know about this paper from Lynn Persson and others, 2022, um, which talks about the use of toxic chemicals has now crossed the point at which human-made changes to the earth push it outside the stable environment of the last 10,000 years. And it's important to note that the chemical industry is the largest industrial energy consumer. The second global chemicals outlook um, really emphasizes the problem and extent of uh, chemical pollution. And as they state, the international chemicals industry is the second largest manufacturing industry in the world, and it's growing. In fact, urgent action, as they say, is needed to tackle chemical pollution as global production is set to double by 2030. And this quote from the report, which is very extensive, is just one example of the the the, the, the problems we face is is also that an an enormous volume of chemicals is released to the environment every year. And I underscore here, most of which is unregulated and much of which is toxic and hazardous. Uh, This projection to double by 2030 um, is happening with no sustainability criteria and it's happening with no discussion as to whether these chemicals are even necessary. And here's uh, a line from Dr. Fatih Biral, the executive director of the International Energy Association that I love to, uh, International Energy Agency that I love to quote, which is petrochemicals are one of the key blind spots in the global energy debate, especially given the influence they will exert on future energy trends. Um, As you can see in the graph here, petrochemicals are the fastest growing sector of oil demand. And it's it's definitely outsurpassing um, the use of oil in transportation by a very wide margin. Much of this projected increase is based on a doubling of plastic production in the next 20 years with the US seen as a growth area enabled by cheap fracked gas and subsidized fossil fuel production. Um, I always find it's amazing for me to think that half of all plastics in use today were produced in the last 20 years. So this is a, a really important reason why this expansion of the petrochemical sector and plastics um, has a direct bearing on Um, the ongoing draw or the pull for fossil fuel production. Um, 
detoxify and decarbonize, I think, are two of my favorite words right now. <laughs> it's, we need uh, both need to go hand in hand. And no better is this understood than by fence line communities. Fence line communities in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world disproportionately suffer from toxic chemicals and climate impacts and continue to fight. These communities continue to fight the permitting of new facilities in their neighborhoods. It's also well known that chemical exposure and legacy pollution unfairly impacts tribal communities, communities of color, and low-income communities. A few years ago, the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform here in the U.S. was formed with a shared vision and goals to drive big and sustained government and private investments to curb carbon and toxic pollution and help ensure that the transition to a clean economy creates inclusive economic opportunities for all communities. The White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council continues to emphasize the need to both detoxify and decarbonize, as stated in this. Um, I just did a quick screenshot of a paper that was submitted by the EJ by the White House EJ Advisory Council um, just this last September, where they point out the most effective way to stop the advance of climate change and the increasingly dire impact on marginalized communities is to, one, directly regulate climate pollution, two, adopt precautionary-based chemicals management systems that require a shift towards banning toxic chemicals and favor safe solutions, and then three, accelerate a managed decline of fossil fuel infrastructure while advancing a just transition for workers and communities. I also invite you to check out the excellent resources and videos at the links here from the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, EJ for All, um, and of course, the. Um, I think these will be provided also on the resource page. Um, they are fantastic videos if you really want to get a really good grounding in um, living at the fence line and more. And then finally, uh, just on this last slide, I do want to mention the Louisville Charter, which is a roadmap to fundamentally transform the chemical industry. No small goal here with the Louisville Charter. Um, why is it called the Louisville Charter? Uh, it's named after an area of Louisville, Kentucky, where industrial facilities have historically released millions of pounds per year of toxic air emissions. 20 years ago, Louisville organizers convened a broad coalition to draft the first Louisville Charter for Safer Chemicals. And in 2021, the charter was updated to more explicitly confront the chemical industry's massive contribution to the climate crisis and provide principal guidance for advancing environmental justice. The solutions plank that I highlight here um, lists a range of actions to detoxify and decarbonize the chemical industry. And there's a lot of um, explanations about the problem statement, about why the petrochemical um, industry is such a massive assault on on our health for people and the environment, but also it includes a lot of immediate and long-term actions that are solution-based. The long-term ones include things like stopping the planned expansion of the petrochemicals and plastics sector, redesigning the current seven chemical feedstocks, which are used to produce 90% of chemicals in use today with lower hazard substitutes, and only producing chemicals that are shown to be safe throughout their life cycle. Um, and I'll just say that all of this will require innovation using the tools and technologies we already have and those yet to be invented. But it will require policy changes that involve impacted communities, placing impacted communities front and center in planning decisions, and it will require investors and the financial community to include chemical footprint reduction into their carbon reduction work. 
Um, chemical footprint is a term used, um, which simply means the measurement of chemicals of high concern in products or processes. And I guess um, leading into this uh, discussion about multi-solving, it really, really important that it requires each of us to do what we can. We find ourselves living now at a time of extraordinary change, and there really is no better time to join forces to both detox and decarbonize. And some of the EJ community involved in this would also really emphasize and democratize. So I'll leave you with that for now. Thank you. Thanks so much for making very clear to all of us as we launch into the discussion, the urgency of this issue and and, and your call to action that now is the time um, to get creative. And, and so I think I want to dive into this conversation with a question. It seems to me that there are two categories of multi-solving solutions we could explore. And first are the more technical solutions at all levels. That includes, as Bev said, innovative products, process and material changes, new policies um, that reduce use of toxic chemicals and also address climate change effectively, that decarbonize and detoxify, as Bev says. And the second category are broader changes, shifts in societal norms and or paradigm shifts, uh, worldview shifts. So, but I want to dive into the first category first and ask each of you to share your thoughts on just some examples. You shared some examples in your introduction, Beth, um, but, but some examples of potential technical multi-solving solutions at this intersection of climate and chemicals. And Bev, I'll toss it to you first to share your thoughts on that. Well, I see the world through a chemical lens. So it's, it's, it's been intriguing for me to dive into the whole decarbonization world. Um, and I keep thinking, how could you apply a chemical footprint reduction integration into the work that's going on with decarbonizing. Um, and I know there's a big, there's a big um, investment right now in the U.S. on decarbonizing, for instance, buildings, um, where there's a big push to go, you know, improved efficiency of low-income public multifamily housing, reduced emissions from building materials, um, things like that. So I'm thinking that if we could bring this chemical lens into all these investments and initiatives and really bring the communities together where we can talk about um, detoxifying building materials and the homes themselves. Beth, I loved your example from New Zealand. I thought that was really, really inspiring. Um, but in my mind, I was jumping to things like I hope the housing also um, had no vinyl flooring, no PFAS treated carpets, no brominated flame retardants in the furnishings to really enhance the health benefits of, of, of good housing. Um, so that that's what comes to mind when I, you know, for those of us listening who work on toxics, we always see products with this chemical lens. And I'm intrigued by how we can bring this decarbonizing world and the detoxifying world together. Yeah, thank you, Beth. Your thoughts on, on Beth's comments and, and also any examples that come to mind for you? Yeah, no, I could see the chat lighten up with people worrying about those homes in New Zealand being too tight and not healthy. Um, and I I honestly don't know what the screens were for chemicals in, in those projects. So it'd be interesting follow-up. Um, but it also, it highlights how separate these worlds are, right? And so um, we have, we talk about a list of, um, I don't know, seven or eight different obstacles to multi-solving, but one of them is disciplinarity. Um, and so if we think about these experts who are trained you know, maybe they're trained in green chemistry, but they're still chemical engineers who might not know much about climate and energy. Um, I've spent so much time with climate experts who probably um, don't know as much about um, toxics and chemicals as they could. So you can see how we've gotten here, right? That we've designed our world as though these are two separate issues when clearly they aren't. Um, 
I did, knowing that we were going to have this conversation, um, think about where are some examples um, of people weaving these threads together. Um, I was, I was, I don't know what people on this call are probably more familiar than I am with the American Chemical Society's um, green, principles of green chemistry, but I was interested to see that in that, I think it was eight principles, one was about energy efficiency and one talked about climate change. Um, and that seems like, you know, a promising bringing these fields together. Um, another area I think about are the different really comprehensive certification systems that are taking place, whether it's green building certification, which does pay attention to energy um, and to materials. I think that's a great example. Um, one project where I'm an advisor that I'm really excited about is here in the U.S., the um, Partnership for Southern Equity based in Atlanta has launched just um, this, this January, actually, their Just Communities Initiative, um, which builds off of a, a um, past program called Eco Districts, which is really focused on um, materials and climate. And now Partnership for Southern Equity um, is, is really a world leading expert in racial justice solutions. And so they're, they're bringing those three things together to talk about what's a just and equitable, climate safe, climate resilient, healthy neighborhood look like. Um, and maybe one last project in that vein, and then um, back to you, Kristen. But um, I think this is happening in many states. The one I'm most familiar with is something called Sustainable CT. So it's a certification system for cities and towns in Connecticut um, that has, again, a, like a whole array of if you're going to be sustainable, what does that look like? And they, they have a very wide definition that includes equity, health, materials, climate, both climate mitigation and climate resilience or climate adaptation. Um, so a few bright spots where I do see people weaving these threads together. Oh, great. Thanks for that. And Bev, any, any response before we move yeah, to that? Yeah, I, 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 I do, I do think more is happening than I'm aware of. Um, and I, and, uh, I know the healthy building network is a great resource for healthy buildings, um, and, and does offer some really pragmatic uh, materials that, um, probably were, are also addressing the whole decarbonization. And I know as the investment is being plowed into decarbonization, a lot of the toxics networks are, you know, getting involved. Um, and I think just, just as another example on food packaging, we're seeing a lot of concern about chemicals in food packaging, the amount of hazardous chemicals that are leaching from plastics into food, into water. Um, and and this call, particularly with so much concern around the burgeoning production of plastics, single-use plastics, et cetera, you're seeing a call for more reusable materials. Um, and and just just as a note, I know that um, pre uh, replacing single-use trays in school cafeterias, this kind of movement um, would really reduce plastics. But also um, recently. Um, there's a whole new certification called the Green Screen Certified for Reusable Food Packaging, Food Serviceware, and Cookware, which ensures the absence of chemicals of concern that also meet recyclability standards for reusables. So, so uh, it, it's it's really good to see these and other certifications that are looking at the inherent hazard chemical ingredients of reusable materials. So that we're we're both bringing down consumption, um, providing a solution to single-use plastics and throw away the whole throwaway economy, but also integrating a nice chemical hazard assessment screen into that. So I hope these kind of things really proliferate in the future as well. Great, yeah. Thanks for that, Bev. And that's that sort of it's a nice segue to that second part of the question about sort of bigger cultural shifts, societal norms, and and kind of that paradigm shift being reducing consumption is on that list, right? Of of how we move that forward as a, as a goal that's going to help meet all kinds of goals. Um, but I want to toss that to you, Beth, for your thoughts on kind of what, what's in this second category of multi-solving change, again, at this intersection of chemicals and climate, what are some needed shifts in our mindset, in our in, in societal norms um, that you'd like to lift up? Yeah, I think to, to open this topic, I'd like to just 
you know, zoom way out and ask what's at the root of both crises, the climate crisis and the chemicals and toxics crisis. And, um, you know, to me, it appears to be um, a dominant culture and economic system that is just really operating, um, you know, in disconnection from how its life support system works. Right. So it's using it's not using the chemistry of the rest of life. Um, it's taking carbon that's safely sequestered in the um, Earth's crust by millions of years of, of um, Earth system processes and just, you know, disregarding that. Um, so the kind of world set worldview reset that um, puts the human economy back in the context of the Earth. And has people defining everything from, you know, the purpose of our lives to the purpose of our uh, institutions and organizations in, in that context. Um, Thomas Berry, the theologian, is, is famous for saying um, the earth is primary and the human is derivative. Um, so he's, you know, he's pointing at a worldview shift. And of course, um, this is a worldview that... Um, uh, is at the root of of indigenous ways of knowing and you know people on earth today very much um, operating out of those principles. So I don't actually think it's a humanity problem. I think it's a it's a, um, an outsized impact of like a smaller um, branch of humanity which has kind of gotten confused about its context. So so there's a worldview shift there um, that. In, in the chat, someone mentioned it's code red for biodiversity as well as climate and chemicals. And you know, the, if you trace the roots back, um, I think you'll you'll find that same root cause. Um, and that sounds really huge, I know, to to say, well, the solution is basically changing everything. Um, one of the things I love about multi solving, though, is that um, you can try to embody that type of a worldview shift, even in very small ways, like how you. Um, organize the community garden in your neighborhood can come out of more of a of a view of the world as being interconnected. Um, and that inspires people and has ripple effects that we don't always know about. So I don't think it has to be this um, unimaginable, like everyone changes at once. I think worldviews are always um, intermingling and, and competing. Um, so I have a few more thoughts, but maybe I'll give Bev a, a shot and and see what, where that goes. Are we talking big picture here or? <laughs> yes, I think so. Big picture. Well, you know, um, I remember when I was a young um, student, I remember reading a book called Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered um, by E.F. Schumacher, and who talks about simplicity and meeting the needs as if people mattered. But the economic system is, um, well, we don't have to go into that in any great detail to know that it's not serving people well. And even when people do great quantifications about um, the health costs of hormone disrupting chemicals um, is over 150 billion euro a year. Imagine what we could do towards health and equity, et cetera, if we simply phased out the production and use of well-known hormone disrupting chemicals in products which are not necessary. Um, I find it amazing that they see, this seems to fall flat. So we, we're we not taking the economic benefits. And I know, Beth, in your paper on multi-solving, you talk about economic benefits. How, you know, my question is, how do we make these economic benef benefits actually stand um, and get integrated into policy. So um, the whole economic system is uh, is is something that intrigues me enormously. You know, as people say, facts won't save us. It's the organizing and political focus on on getting these things moving into the right way. Um, Certainly on the petrochemical sector, um, it, it also comes down to who has control and the, the political powers that be um, are, are, again, well known. But I think what what is less well known are corporations such as ExxonMobil are also one of the biggest plastic producers in the world today. So I I, I think the narrative has to be 
you know, economics for whose benefit? Economics is that people mattered is what we need to get back to. Yeah, thanks for that, Bev. And I think it's it's always, it's interesting diving into these big picture discussions to remind ourselves that it it hasn't always been this way. I mean, I think the one of the hurdles, right, when we think about change is like, oh, well, it's too big. We can't make these kind of changes. It's just the way things are. But it really hasn't been this way and doesn't necessarily need to be this way, the way we've set up our, our economic system and, and our focus on consumer products and so on. Beth, any any other thoughts on this on this topic before we? Yeah, mm-hmm. I would just briefly love to to raise two more ideas. Um, one is to think about as we have to recreate the world to address climate change, um, we can be really creative about that, and it doesn't have to look like just replacing what we have today and plugging it into a different clean energy system, right? And so, you know. Um, a good, a simple example of that is um, internal combustion vehicles versus electric vehicles. Like electric vehicles are going to be an important part of the solution. They're going to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we don't have to keep building our cities around cars, right? We can make them dense and walkable. Um, and when that happens, then it's not just the energy footprint that goes down, it's the materials footprint that goes down. And when the materials footprint goes down, you need less extraction and less um, petrochemicals, et cetera. So anywhere where we can find all those sort of sweet spots of efficiency and really focusing on on people's needs rather than a kind of non-creative just replicating of current systems. I think there's a, a huge leverage point there. Um, and just, I know we, we've been saying this, but I think it, it can't really be said too often. Um, enforcing human and civil rights for all people in the United States and in the world um, is a lever for both of these crises, the climate crisis and the chemical crisis. Like they only can persist because um, we allow our societies to have sacrifice zones. Um, you know, we might call them fence line communities or low lying islands, but they're sacrifice zones for these two industries. And um, if, as Bev just said, all people mattered, you know, these industries that are doing so much damage wouldn't be economically profitable at all. Um, so, um, actually things like, like voting rights are solutions to both of these issues. Thanks for that. No, that's a really important point. I have a related question, which is we often will talk about false solutions to some of these problems and, and, you know, where a lot of investment goes, where it's actually not going to have the kind of impact that's needed and, and might do more harm in some ways than, than move us in the right direction. And I'm wondering if both of you could share just your thoughts on sort of some examples of false solutions at this intersection and how we might guard against them. Beverly. Well, I I tell you, one of my pet peeves is um, this whole promotion of the uh, circular economy, which is not prioritizing um, chemical hazards. And I'll give you a great example, which is very unfortunate, but it is true. It's... um, bio-based polyvinyl chloride, bio-based PVC, uh, which is certified by the Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterials, but lacks any consideration of chemical hazard. So um, unfortunately, the marketing is that it is advancing the transition to a bio-based and circular economy. This whole fixation on bio-based and circular with no consideration of chemical hazard or toxicity is a real problem. And we need to educate um, organizations who think this is the way forward. Um, We need to make sure that the current Biden administration's push on the bioeconomy is really um, integrating chemical hazard assessment into this this whole thing. And I'll give you one last example, which is absolutely uh, crucial to what's happening with the petrochemical sector right now in the U.S. is the um, the whole push on decarbonizing chemicals, uh, current $38 million investment in projects which will, you know, aim to increase energy efficiency and reduce the carbon inputs from the production of high volume chemicals. Again, there's no consideration of the toxicity of these chemicals. There's no discussion about changing these feedstock chemicals to um, sustainable chemistry principles and green chemistry design. 
And we're really missing a really big opportunity right now. So um, I, I know the um, the WEJAC, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council is trying to push these 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 kind of inter this integration forward. But the amount of money that's being plowed into this right now is like really crucial that we address it. Thanks. Thanks, Bev. Bev, <laughs> for those thoughts. Really appreciate it. Beth, what are you what are your thoughts on the false solution question? Um, well, I think one way that's useful to think about this is to really, um, in my field of systems analysis, we we sometimes draw um, what we call our stock and flow maps, right? And so it would start at the point of extraction and go through all the stages, whether it's petrochemicals for energy or petro or uh, fossil fuels for energy or for petrochemicals and plastics. Um, and at each step along that way, you go from extraction to shipping to refining um, to burning or to manufacturing these plastics, there are there there's impacts. Um, and some of the what I would call false solutions are things that are focused pretty far down that chain. Um, in climate change, there's lots of talk about carbon capture and storage, right? So you you run that whole process and at the very end you suck the CO2 back out of the air. Um, but you can't suck back the water that's been polluted along the way, the communities near refineries, et cetera. Um, so, you know, those those kind of at the source of extraction solutions seem to me the ones that with the most ramifying impacts for good. And of course, they're also the most politically difficult. Um, but it does seem as though if the if the um, there was even more alignment between the chemical safety movement and the climate safety movement, um, you know, that would be a common point of focus. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks to both of you for that. I One final question from me, and then we'll turn to questions from the participants. I know there's been a lively discussion going on in the chat. Um, and thanks to those who've added your questions to the Q&A box. If you haven't yet, now's the time. Um, but my final question is, is a forward-looking one, right? All of these, you've, all, you've both touched on this in, in a certain way, but, but what would you say are some concrete ways um, to support moving toward multi-solving in this sector, in this intersection of chemicals and climate um, to move in the right direction, both in terms of technical solutions and paradigm shifts. What, what, can, we, what can we do? What should we be focused on? And Beth, well, I'll turn it to you first this time. Well, I would just point to um, these principles that we see when we look across examples of multi-solving, that they're so diverse and yet you have this feeling of something in common. Um, and so I mentioned a few of those at the beginning, but I think what we would be looking for is bringing more of these kind of ways of operating um, into the nexus between chemicals and climate. Um, so insisting on being multidisciplinary, right? Um, in, and taking the time to um, like demystify each other's expertise because that has to happen, right? I might have to learn about um, the language of toxic chemicals if I've been working on climate and vice versa, but that's an investment that's really important. Um, building um, that sense of trusting relationships across these different fields and making sure to include those with lived experience of climate change and of chemicals, as well as kind of professional expertise um, and really following and centering the lead of impacted communities. Um, you know, this, we know we're in an emergency and I know that the things I'm saying um, sound scary because they sound like they take time. Like there's not time to listen, learn, build trust. Um, but I, I have um, a couple quotes that I always rely on right next to my uh, computer on my desk. And one of them is by Thomas Berry, um, who says the we're in an emergency and the nature of this emergency is it's one that requires patience and that it's very much a trial to have patients in an emergency. But that's the only route that I see. And I also would just hold up the mirror and ask if our siloed approaches, um, you know, how many, we just had the 28th uh, UNFCCC meeting on, on climate in uh, November. Um, are, are our siloed approaches getting the results we want? I don't think they are. So um, maybe it's time to go slow in order to build um, power and different, more creative solutions. 
Thanks so much. Bev. Oh, um, well, I'm I'm seeing more synergies um, between all sorts of groups saying very similar things. I'm seeing synergies with the scientific community that are now calling for a cap on petrochemical expansion, calling for a cap on plastics production, scientists, not just NGOs and people being directly impacted. Um, I'm seeing things like the International Energy um, Agency call for the elimination of fossil fuel subsidies on the chemical sector. This is the IEA. This isn't, again, you know, other segments of society um, calling for a ban on single use plastics and producer responsibility. And I think that we just have to be brave enough to say we're not on the fringes anymore. Um, this is now mainstream. We have to just take the 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 energy of the fact that so many of us are saying similar things. And what just I know, Kristen, you're going to ask this, you know, what brings me hope is the fact that we can all build on these common principles if we are more effectively working together and sharing ideas and trying things out, maybe failing in messaging or communicating or strategies, but, you know, keep plowing forward. I think there's a huge opportunity for innovation and create creativity and um, just, just, you know, the fact that we could be networking more, more effectively, which would also be really fun. I mean, I always say that solutions work has to have an element of joy about it. And so that's sort of my parting the thinking on that. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Bev. And thanks to you both for your thoughtful, um, replies and thinking and, and on all of these, um, all these questions we've been diving into. So I am going to move now to questions from our participants. And again, I know there's been a, a lot of information and thought shared in the chat and um, invite people if they do have questions for Bev and or Beth to put those in the Q&A uh, now. And we'll um, start with uh, an actual a, a concrete example of a, of a health outcome that I know we're all concerned about. So this is from Anne in rural Vermont. Could each of you share thoughts about the fact that there are more children getting rare forms of cancer in recent years, likely from exposure to chemicals in homes and air, and connecting cancer prevention to climate control and chemical regulation? Either of you like to share thoughts on that? It's very disconcerting to see the rise in health impacts from chemicals and cancer. And I think what this comes down to is trying out new messaging um, that brings things like prevention of cancer from being exposed in the womb and in daily lives uh, to hazardous chemicals in our homes and in our air. But also, how do we take that from a, the need for chemical policy reform and chemical use reform and safer substitutes, chemicals, how do we bring that into the climate change world is, is I think, where we have to start um, as Beth was talking about, you know, using similar language towards the same goal. Um, and I see this as a communication challenge for us to bring the, uh, we're better off if we can reduce the use of chemicals, stop the increase in the petrochemical sector, which is a huge driver for climate change. How much better off would we be from a cancer prevention point of view, that would be an interesting focus to really discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Beth. Beth, anything to add on that question? No, I think that was, that was a great answer from Beth. Okay. Um, I have a couple of just quick, small questions where folks are following up on some of what you'd already mentioned. The name of the organization that's looking at plastics in food, specifically lunch trays, et cetera. Bev? What was the organization? Um, it's Clean Production Action, which runs the Green Screen Certification Program. Right. Green Screen Certified. Green Screen is the green screen for safer chemicals. It's a hazard assessment tool, which is a really good way to simplify the complexity of chemical hazard, which, again, I think is something else we have to get better at is, Beth, you were talking about demystifying the chemical world. I know I have this problem all the time. 
we're not trying to go chemical free. We're, we're trying to go hazardous chemical free because there are benign chemicals. But when I give lectures, even to master's students at Lund University, they usually at the end of every year, they say to me, how come we've never learned this before? How could I get to a master's degree level and not understand the health impacts from chemicals and chemical policy and how companies are really reducing their chemical footprint? So we have a long way to go with this integration um, of things that some of us have been working on for 30 years and find it incredibly easy to talk about. Um, we need to bring that language into the whole decarbonization world and education and the medical profession in general as well. Sorry, I went off on a tangent on that. No, one. that's all right. Um, and I, I also just a quick question for you, Beth. Um, someone's interested, wants to hear again, the source of the quote of we're in an emergency that requires patience. Is that Wendell Berry? That is Wendell Berry. Um, it was an interview, I think, with Bill Moyers. Um, I don't have the link handy to put in the chat, but but you could find it online. Great. Thanks for that. Um, so another question that is it goes back to the um, kind of one sector that contributes a lot to both of these problems. This is from Barry. Seems the packaging and shipping industries need some guidance on their excesses, multiple box shipping difficulties and getting single component waste streams, related issues, plus all the excess single use plastics in those industries as well. Any reflections on how to influence and uh, move toward solutions in the, in the shipping and packaging industries? Well, I'm not at all an expert on either of those industries, but I have studied systems for a long time. And what I would say is um, systems, you know, just respond to the incentives that the humans in charge have created. Um, and my friend Nathaniel Smith, who's the founder of Partnership for Southern Equity, um, he says the policies in place are a reflection of the values of the people in power. So that would be the second, like systems respond to policies and policies are shaped by values and values are connected to power, like whose values are being um, embedded in the systems we live with. So I, I, it sounds a little bit like a broken record, but I think we just keep coming back to um, these systems have evolved to places where they're, they aren't serving the well-being of the whole. They aren't serving the well-being of um, uh, the future. Uh, someone who brought up childhood cancer, they're not serving the well-being of children by and large. Mm -hmm. um, and and to, to recognize that the struggle is one of, of values, I think, and, uh, and of power. Bev, anything to add? Well, the whole thing about plastics is um, it, it's a massive focus right now, both from a chemical and from a climate change perspective um, with the, you know, the trying to hammer out this international plastics treaty, um, which uh, is, is seeing a big focus on the chemical, the hazardous chemical constituents of plastics, the massive global contamination from plastics. Is there a solution to this plastics mess? Um, and, and so every time I hear the word plastics, um, um, I, I think back to some of the studies on, um, you know, some plastic products are, contain over 8,000 chemicals, which only 8% of which are known or characterized or et cetera. So the whole material science, uh, looking at plastics and the life cycle of plastics and the 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 focus on plastics is leading some um, material designers to look at could you make a benign polymer and what would the uses be for that and what would the end of life and recycling potential or the compostability potential be for that so um, I think it would be interesting to find out what's going on with some of the new thinking on polymer design. Is there such a thing as a benign polymer plastic, synthetically made plastic? And I, I, I that's where my mind goes when I hear the word plastic. Um, some of the um, recommendations from researchers are that we have, we should really only be using a handful of well-characterized and known chemicals to make plastics, which would be a massive change from our current production system for plastics. So 
that's what comes to my mind when I hear the use of plastics. But, you know, can we fulfill the function of plastics in a different way with different materials? Do we need plastics at all? And, and I think we, we've lost the ability to, when we think of substitutes, we're losing that focus on functional substitution. What is it we're trying to do? And can we simply d- not use any materials at all? Is there a way to, you know, redesign the system? But as with Beth, I'm, I'm not really a, any kind of reader or um, researcher on transportation systems. Yeah. No, thanks for that, though. But the systems kind of approach is potentially a powerful one. And a follow-up question for you, Bev, from, from Pam Eliason, um, which is flipping the, can you comment further on how the climate movement can better build in toxicity considerations, toxic use reduction, green chemistry? And you, you've spoken a little bit about this, but anything additional you'd like to add? I mean, I don't know how we could be, we need to be better coordinated. How that happens, I think, is for all of us to dis- to discuss. Um, because some of us on this call are from the climate change movement and others are from the toxicity, the chemicals movement. Um, maybe some work in um, organizations where there are these cross discussions, but how do we break down some of the silos and how can we do this cross fertilization of ideas? That would be a really good discussion. I don't have the million dollar answer on this um, but I know it needs to happen, and it would be a really creative process to see this happen. I think one potential opportunity, especially because I know there's some state and local and federal government folks on this call, um, there is a lot of thought to preparing for coming climate instability. And um, I've been thinking about um, the toxic legacy that is at risk of being disturbed, whether it's from storms or fires um, or floods, et cetera. And so I think there's a leverage point here to really, um, get our government agencies to integrate climate adaptation and toxic chemicals. Um, and of course the best thing would be to make sure our communities aren't full of toxic chemicals that are at risk of being dispersed by climate disasters. Um, and it may be that's being handled. I haven't really come across people at that intersection, but I bet there are some early, early uh, thinkers about that. Sorry, I would just also add the whole network of uh, s- sustainable food solutions. Mm-hmm. The um, One of the groups I love working with is something called the Campaign for Healthier Solutions, or otherwise known as the Dollar Store Campaign here in the U.S., where one of the things is not just to try to get dollar stores to reduce their um, chemical footprint in the products that they put on their shelves, but also to buy in um, food that is, you know, produced locally, which would then benefit people like Lideris Campesinas, you know, the women farm workers in California. Um, there's some projects that are in the in the pipeline. Um, the this whole thing about bringing in nutritious food that um, is grown organically generates livelihoods and is really benefiting, you know, people that have to go to dollar stores, I think is just as another example of multi-solving here, Beth. Um, But every time when we talk chemicals, I just also want to ground it in our food supply. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think organic agriculture is, again, why are we not seeing it economically as as if economics mattered? Why are we not seeing this? Um, better promoted. I think that's a real important discussion within this chemical climate nexus. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, So one final question from our participants, and there are lots of good questions here that we're not going to be able to get to. Um, So we'll check with Bev and Beth and see if they're willing to maybe follow up um, with some additional responses after after today's webinar. But I wanted to... um, end with a question from Stephanie White. She says, it seems like the solutions that get the most traction are the ones that can be monetized, which also keep silos in place. For some of the solutions you mentioned that succeed, what were the non-monetized features of the solution that were crucial to its implementation? And Beth, I want to toss that to you first. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, at the very beginning, I, I posed that question, like, why is multi-solving rare? 
um, when uh, on paper, actually these solutions often are um, even even at the basis of monetization, um, the most efficient ones. So for instance, the World Health Organization puts a report out almost every year saying meeting the Paris Climate Accords would more than pay for itself on the basis of the health system savings. And that's mostly from less air pollution and the diseases like um, respiratory disease, cardiac disease, um, uh, dementia that are increasingly being linked to air pollution. Um, and yet only something like one in five countries connects their um, health policy and their climate policy for the for the UN uh, system. So why is that? And it's because decisions get made in subsystems instead of whole systems. Like a system can't find the optimal solution if, the, if there's a loser, right? And so in that example I just gave, the costs fall to the energy and transportation sectors if a country is going to decarbonize. And there might be these kind of windfalls for the health sector, but the energy minister, the transportation minister, isn't going to build a political clear career on spending more money that helps out the health sector. Um, and so I think it's often this system's problem of, of making decisions in, in fragmentation. Um, at particularly local government seems to be and, and state um, experimenting with different budgeting processes so that the well-being of the whole can be handled better. And I think there's a lot of progress there. Um, the last thing I'll say is there's a time dimension that's tricky. So it's true what the World Health Organization says. And also the fact that in the future, someone won't die from a disease caused by air pollution, that doesn't actually give you money to buy a solar panel today, right? Those future savings. Um, and so in that world of impact investing um, and social impact bonds and different ways to try to, to um, address that problem, I, I think there's some potential, although I have a lot to learn about um, those mechanisms. Well, I have I have one final question for each of you as we're wrapping up. We're we're nearing the end of our time together. Um, so, as we all know, working on global crises is a challenging thing. It can be overwhelming and daunting. Um, so, I want to ask each of you what gives you hope as you do this work. And Bev, you touched on this a little bit in a previous answer, um, but I'm going to start with you and see if you wanted to add anything to what you shared before. Well, I've always been a solutions searcher. I search for solutions. I think the whole clean production, you know, framing that we sort of formed back in the late 80s um, is just a way to frame the way forward. We don't have the answers. We don't have necessarily have the details, but we need those principal guidance on, on what we're all trying to achieve. And so I think that for solutions to detox, decarbonize, and bring equity, I think are there. Some of them are already happening, but I think the more we can network and share these stories and build build the movement, um, it it does give me hope. I I think we are, you know, we're we're facing an extraordinary time in history, and we can't do piecemeal business as usual anymore. We just can't. So I really want to see the funding community, the financial community, and I think all of us that have impact in our own lives and in our work really find a way that we can better better network on, on this, 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 this intersection between toxicity and climate so that we are working towards a just, equitable, renewable energy detox future. I think we just have to have that in our heads and know that what we're doing is contributing toward it. It builds our own momentum. It might not all happen in our own lifetime, but we certainly owe it to our children's children's children and people who aren't born for, you know, a thousand years from now. So uh, we, we just have to stay on the positive solution oriented side but we we need each other to to bolster our own energy levels i think as we move forward and creativity thank you bev beth well i think we all 
are familiar with this idea of neuroplasticity, right? How our brains are not static and can rewire um, either after an injury or as we learn new things. Um, well, systems have a plasticity like that. And one thing that multi-solving does is it rewires systems. And long after the new orchard is built or there's a bike lane or a plastics treaty, there's relationships between people. Um, and if it was a multi-solving effort, those relationships are spanning fractures, right? Because that's what silos, disciplines, jurisdictions are. The world is whole and indivisible and human systems have divided it into pieces. And so people reaching across those silos are doing a little bit of healing at each one of them. Um, and the potential of that, I think it's just like the potential of neuroplasticity in our brains. Um, we say that if you want systems to behave differently, you change how they're interconnected. Um, and that is happening as uh, I think we've had so many examples just in the last hour um, as the dots get connected from cancer to health, to climate, to air, to, to water, to chemicals. Um, so just keep connecting. Um, and uh, the thing about that systems principle is it's uncontrollable. It's it's called emergence um, to, in the, in the sort of uh, systems terms. And it's, it's powerful, but it's not entirely predictable. So we don't have to know how it's all going to work out to know that it's worth spanning those silos. Well, I can say that you both give me hope. <laughs> you know, just knowing that you are in this work and um, bringing your brilliance and your experience and your leadership is um, makes me feel really hopeful. So I want to thank you both for for that work and for being here with us today. And thanks also to all the participants for your excellent and thought provoking questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. I know there was a lot of back and forth and, and vibrant conversation in the chat. I think the settings are set. So if you want to download that before you log off, you can save that. If you wanna keep some of those resources, we'll also collect them and send them around with the recording in a week or so. Um, also wanted to say thank you to my colleague, Dr. Rachel Massey, for support behind the scenes, as well as, as uh, Kelsey mm, Eccles, who is with the Multi-Solving Institute, who is also helping provide links and, and support behind the scenes as well. And thanks to our co-hosts at the New School, Kira and Ken. And with that, Kira, I will hand it back to you. Thank you, Beth, Bev, and Kristen, and everybody over there at Che. Definitely an important conversation, and I hope it will amplify the concept and practice of multi-solving uh, for so many issues. And I'm looking forward to the recording and having that get out there as well. Just a reminder, if you want to rewatch or re-listen to the conversation, or if you want to share it with others, or if you follow the new school feeds on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, you'll see when the recordings are posted. Our next co-presented TNS, The New School, and Che Cafe conversation is coming up soon. March 6th, we welcome Kristen back uh, with an excellent panel to talk about Petroleum 236, a seven-year investigation of oil field radioactivity. You can register for that on either of our websites. Thank you all for joining us at The New School at Commonweal and the Che Cafe, and we'll see you next time, everyone. Thanks again. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, 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 don't, 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 don't